Ecuador, the smallest of the Andes states in South America, and a land that derived its name from the equator, a natural paradise with a living Indian culture and captivating colonial towns. Once part of the Inca realm and later the sought-after possession of various European colonial powers, Quito, the divine city and capital of Ecuador. La Basilica is situated on a hill north of Quito. It is the architectural symbol of an autocratic Catholic church that dominated the country's faithful until the liberal revolution. A monumental building 140 meters long and 35 meters wide. In the most recent buildings to be constructed, the tradition of medieval glass painting was used for the basilica's large colorful windows. The city's religious culture lives on. Steep and narrow steps lead downhill to the Centro Historico. Many of these small buildings have been rebuilt several times due to devastating earthquakes. On the 6th of December 1536, Quito was newly founded and built on the ruins of an Inca town. So originated the Plaza Grande, the square in which many of the country's historic events have taken place. From the country's foundation until its independence. Military parades are a reminder of colonial times. For around 200 years, the city was under the control of the Vice Kingdom of Peru. Later, Quito belonged to the Vice Kingdom of New Granada, until finally, in 1822, General José Sucre succeeded the Spaniards who were loyal to the crown. The Catedral Metropolitana is located on one side of the square. The entire complex is a combination of various building epochs. After each earthquake, the church was rebuilt and substantially enlarged. In the Calle Garcia Marina that begins in the Plaza Grande is the entrance to El Sagrario, the former sacrament chapel of the cathedral. Gilded carvings shine out in every corner. Today the city has a new attraction, El Teleférico, the highest cable car in South America. The spectacular views are quite overwhelming. Below is the metropolis, snugly located in a valley, between volcanic mountains and snow-covered peaks. When the Spaniards conquered the Inca realm, various Catholic orders emerged. So the Jesuit order built the Baroque La Campania de Jesus Church that is known as the greatest house of God in Latin America. San Francisco Square in front of the monastery has, since the arrival of the Spanish, been one of the city's three central meeting places and is situated above the Plaza Grande. The monks of the Franciscan order settled here. The tiny Plaza del Teatro, that was once a marketplace and slaughterhouse, has, since 1887, featured the neoclassical Teatro Sucre, the city's most beautiful theater. It's not difficult to imagine the splendor and elegance of the various festivities that take place in these noble halls. The Augustin Order also has a monastery in Quito. The interior of the church is abundantly decorated with paintings and carvings. A valuable decorated panelled ceiling adorns the Sala Capitular. And the green inner courtyard has one of the most beautiful patios in the world. The old town of Quito features numerous monuments and churches, 
In a single square kilometer, there are no less than 16 religious buildings. The Calle de la Ronda is the city's oldest street, subtly hiding the secret of what lies within. These beautiful old houses with balconies, inner courtyards and wooden stairs are tightly packed together. A performance by the Ballet Indio Humanizate demonstrates the spirit of the city's indigenous inhabitants. The country's large variety of regions, all united by the Andes. The roots that date back to the Inca realm evoke both melancholy and pride. A huge iron statue of the winged Virgin of Quito, the symbol of the city, is situated upon the El Panichilo volcano that seems to protect the old town. It was once a strategic location, but today is a popular destination for one and all. The city's third largest square is part of the monastery complex of the Dominican order, Santo Domingo. The interior is more modest than most of the city's other sacred buildings. The splendid red-gold painted Capilla Virgen del Rosario shines out in all its divine beauty. Whitewashed walls encircle a large inner courtyard and arcades. The former capital of the northern Inca realm became the most Spanish city of the New World and churches, monasteries and squares continue to impress with their colonial splendor, the legacy of a rich and dramatic past. West of Quito, the edge of the extinct Pululahua volcano is accessible by car. It's the largest volcanic crater in South America. The huge caldera with its steep slopes has a diameter of four to five kilometers and is hundreds of meters deep. The bottom of the crater was inhabited from Inca times and its slopes are protected natural areas. Around 20 kilometers north of Quito is the Mitad del Mundo, the center of the world. Male busts line the route to the main monument. They represent the men who, in 1736, were sent by the French king, Ludwig XV, to identify the equator and to measure the exact circumference of the Earth. Unfortunately, their calculations were not precise and the real equator lies about 100 meters away, but that's of no real importance. What really matters is the ability to see the dividing line between the northern and southern hemispheres. Next to the center of the world, there's an open-air museum, and it's here the actual equatorial line is located. An ancient Indian village was replicated here in order to demonstrate the traditions and lifestyle of the former inhabitants of Ecuador. The Warani tribe had its own style of dwellings, which were inhabited by their extended families. Here, their descendants explain the history of the tribe. The practice of various religious and cultural rituals also takes place here, such as the brutal Sansa ritual in which humans were beheaded. Nearby, the Incan ruins of Rumicucho can be visited. It has a magnificent view of the surrounding landscape. Its terrace-like stone walls were once part of a fortress that in Inca times served as an outpost for the subjection of the northern tribes. In 
In the second half of the 15th century, coming from Peru, the Incas conquered what is today's Ecuador. They were militarily well organized and chose locations that were easy to defend. After his father's death in 1525, Atahualpa, the favorite son of the Inca monarch Huayna Capac, inherited the fragmented realm of Quito. An excursion takes us east on a road that leads down into the depths of the Amazon basin. But this is nevertheless still a high mountain area. We traverse the Papalacta Pass that is often covered in snow and at a deeper lying water reservoir we enter a small side valley. One and a half hours from Quito are the Termas de Papalacta, the most beautiful spa baths in Ecuador. Hot springs were discovered here and an infrastructure built to make them accessible to tourism. An idyllic spot set in remote nature at an altitude of around 4,000 meters above sea level. Resorts with large pool areas were built here. And there's no hint that three hours downhill is the Amazon jungle. At weekends, this area is very popular with city folk. Relaxation in hot thermal water is indeed highly relaxing. Before traveling south, our curiosity for new discoveries leads us into the northern highlands of the Andes. The small village of Quinque has a fine white church with blue pinnacles and dome. It's a pilgrimage destination for the Indios. This shrine contains the mother of Quinque. Since 1985, it's been a national sanctuary, the Holy Madonna with Child, patron saint of the Mountain Indias. The Ruta de los Lagos winds further north between the west and east Cordilleras. And every now and then we encounter numerous lakes. At the point at which the road crosses the equator is a large concrete globe. The picturesque mountain landscape features several volcanoes, such as Cayambe and the Imbabura, in front of which is the Lago de San Pablo. This impressive scenery also contains the meeting point of the north, Otavalo the region's most famous capital and shopping center. The city of the Otavalo Indians was built around a small square. On the western edge of the city, each Saturday, there's an animal market. Here, chicken, geese, sheep, pigs, horses, cows and llamas are for sale. The animals wait patiently for their new owners and come to this weekly market from the far-flung villages of the area. Choosing the best animals is a demanding task, so there are plenty of stalls that display a tempting range of appetizing food. Several of the animals change hands and are contentedly taken to their new homes. There are also fledglings on offer. But Otavalo really became well known due to its arts and crafts. Weaving, embroidery, the making of hats and carving helped to make the city prosper. The famous poncho market takes place each Saturday in the city's alleys and squares. It's always an adventure for both tourists and locals alike. In some of the alleys, fruit and vegetables are on offer. 
fresh local produce, tomatoes, onions, pineapples, bananas and avocados. Many of the women are attired in traditional clothing. They examine the fresh goods while having a friendly chat. Babies sleep peacefully. Close to the city is the Hacienda Pisaki, a wonderful estate that was built in 1790 for the manufacture of textiles and with more than 1,000 weavers. Here, Simon Bolivar, while on his travels to Bogota, no doubt appreciated the estate's fireplaces, canopy beds and elegant lounges. Many constitutional agreements were made here. On a hill at the edge of the city, the park Condor was established, a bird park for condors and various other birds of prey of the Andes region. The impressive and dramatic scenery of the surrounding volcanoes forms the perfect backdrop for the monarchs of the sky. The birds guard their new realm. After a short journey, we arrive at a city of leather goods. Kotachi, a small town with squat houses and a square that is framed by palm trees and acacias, plus an imposing colonial church. The name of the town means to grind salt, which indicates that the working of leather has not always been the main business here. Here lives a mainly Indian population that clings to its traditions. The road passes by neatly arranged, colourful buildings and soon exits the town, constantly uphill, to the extinct Kotakachi volcano. We arrive at the entrance to the national park. At an altitude of about 3,300 metres is Lago Quicocha, located close to a large volcano. It's one of the most beautiful crater lagoons in Ecuador. In the middle are two small islands. Steep cliffs with highland vegetation extend down directly to the banks that are covered with totara reed. Next, we return to Quito. On the edge of the city is a small station. This is the Chiva Express, a colourful bus on rails, a final word with the conductor, and passengers wave farewell. The journey begins. We travel through the outskirts of the city, an adventurous journey on the Ferro de los Volcanes, along the road of volcanoes. We pass through several small villages, but soon only nature accompanies our journey. The fertile highlands of the Andes between snow-covered volcanoes. Close to Machachi, the first section of the railway line comes to an end. We stop in the middle of nowhere and disembark the train, and are greeted by a man on horseback. He is the owner of the Hacienda Alegria, for four generations, the Hacienda has been a colonial estate and has been open to tourists for several years. In addition to horses, cows are bred for milk and meat production and llamas provide wool as well as being a means of transport. There's a small group of llamas, plus an informative talk. As early as 2500 BC, the llama was domesticated in Peru and it's lived in the Andes highlands ever since.
With much sweat, labor, and perseverance, generations of immigrants have established a state such as this within the remote landscape. Further south, we travel on the Panamericana Sur, and more volcanoes appear along our route, such as the Cotopaxi and Ilinitsa Sur. As throughout Latin America, huge Spanish estates originated on Indian land in the high valleys of the Sierra. Here, roses are cultivated. Ecuador produces 109 million kilos of roses each year and is one of the largest rose-producing countries in the world. Long-stemmed, high-quality products from the Andes Highlands. The climate of this region is ideal for roses. And over the course of time, the logistics of worldwide distribution have been perfected to a fine art. The colorful bags of flowers are placed on a special holding device that is fixed to ropes that lead through large tents. A perfect system. Next, the hangers are pulled into a central hall. Workers clean the roses and check the quality of the blossoms. Then they're transported to the airport. We continue on the Panamericana Sur, a road that travels from Alaska in the north of America right across the continent to as far as the coast of Tierra del Fuego. The green and fertile pastures in the shadow of the Carihuayazo volcanoes look like those in the Alps. There are rails too, although they're no longer in use, and the small Urbina station has also survived. Located at the foot of the volcano, it is a scene of lonely isolation. It's amazing to think that a small steam engine once called this old and abandoned train station high up in the mountains. We travel through a valley, uphill and downhill, and through many small villages. Rocky highlands with green areas dominate the landscape, the route to the deep Amazon area. Gateway into El Oriente. The small town of Banos nestles between steep mountain slopes. It's a tourist spa town with hot springs and a monastery that is a place of pilgrimage that pays homage to the Virgin Mary. The town has 50 hotels, the highest concentration of hotels in Ecuador, a place of joie de vivre. In the town's cafes, people sit al fresco and enjoy the relaxing atmosphere of this pulsating place. A small animal park, the Parque Eco Zoologico, contains many indigenous animals. It's a must for any visitor to Banos. The Canyon del Pastaza dominates the region. It's a wild green canyon that accompanies the Rio Pastaza down to the Amazon. From each side, waterfalls plunge down into the deep cut riverbed, and a journey on the waterfall route is quite an experience. This impressive natural spectacle makes it easy to forget that in 2006, the Tunguraka volcano became active, spewing its ash over large areas. Since time immemorial, these water masses have plunged down into the depths of the Oriente. So man has taken advantage of the primeval and immense power of the water here. In the coldest periods of the Ice Age, the snow line of the Andes lay deeper. A huge glacier, with amazing lakes, 
and hanging valleys and waterfalls. An enchanting and overwhelming natural spectacle. A special attraction is a cable car that crosses the canyon at breathtaking altitude without any serious protection. It is an open platform with tiny fences that is slowly pulled across the deep abyss to a large waterfall. Here our journey into the side valley of the cleft and almost inaccessible western cordillera comes to an end. Back on the Panamericana Sur, we travel past mountain ranges and small lakes until the site of numerous buildings announces the suburbs of the capital of the province of Chimborazo. Rio Bamba, a city that following liberation by the Spanish was for three years the capital of Ecuador. This is the exact center of Ecuador. That explains the existence of the monument of geographer Pedro Maldonado in the square in front of the cathedral. The facades of the 19th century buildings, plus a well-ordered street network, make this colonial city a fine example of urban planning. The original Riobamba was situated 20 kilometers from here and was founded in 1534 above a destroyed Inca settlement. However, in 1797, a devastating earthquake destroyed everything and two years later, it was rebuilt. Huge mosaics feature both the country's and the city's past a moving and dramatic history. From the Spanish conquest, then the colonial period, until independence. Occasionally early in the morning when the city is still asleep, the small station opens briefly. Then the rail bus appears out of the darkness. A second twin train because the railway line is only accessible in certain sections. The Chivar Express leaves the city whose roads are still empty and soon the morning sun submerges the otherwise dreary suburb beneath a friendly sky. From Riobamba, we continue in a southerly direction through the province of Chimborazo. Frequently, we cross the Panamericana. Road traffic must stop as our fast bus has the right of way. About 40 kilometers south of Riobamba, we reach Guamote. The rail bus stops in the center of the village. It doesn't disturb the traffic simply because there isn't any. Here the streets are of mud, cobblestone and there are colourful buildings. When the Chiva Express and other buses stop here, passengers are given the opportunity to enjoy a meal in the village's open-air kitchens. A roast pig makes for a tasty treat. An idyll amid the Andean highlands. When the rail bus arrives at its weekly destination, it has to struggle through much hustle and bustle because this is market day. Mountain farmers in ponchos and felt headwear arrive from the surrounding villages in small lorries and on foot with their animals. They sell the vegetables and fruit that they have cultivated. For the women with their colorful ponchos, market day means much shopping and chatting an authentic market. Meat is sold both raw and roasted next to market stalls that sell underwear and hygiene products. At the end of market day everyone returns to their village. 
The journey on the rail bus continues. The adventure continues. A remarkable journey on the road of volcanoes. Our route passes through the half desert of Teocayas and through the Rio Pomachachi Canyon. We reach the end of the second rail section, Palmira Station. The rails are arranged in such a way that the train is able to turn around and enter the station back to front. Here we leave the rail bus. It's impossible to continue by rail. The second bus on rails is cleaned and examined while the small station falls into sleep. The Cheever Express returns and we continue on the Panamericana further south through high valleys and pastures and over mountain passes, both uphill and downhill. Here this dream road becomes a single lane and certainly not a highway. There's little traffic here. After an hour we reach Alausi, deep down in the valley but nevertheless at an altitude of 2,356 meters above sea level. A small town of the Sierras that during its high season was a holiday resort for the rich of Guayaquil. The highland climate fascinated the people of the Pacific coastal region. During the rule of President Eloy Alfaro, the railway line from Guayaquil to Quito was built. He established a compulsory education and ordered the construction of kindergartens, schools and universities. Today the street in front of the small station is deserted, but at the beginning of the 20th century, Araosi enjoyed some economic success. Suddenly it appears, the third version of the Chiva Express. Again, it is similar to the other two and is ready for the third and most spectacular leg of the journey. The rail bus has become a common sight and duly arrives at the platform. Passengers get on board and the last part of the adventure is about to begin. Slowly, the rail bus departs from the small village of Alausi. We pass numerous buildings situated on steep slopes. The railway line was blasted into the rock face, an architectural masterpiece. Suddenly and unexpectedly we stop. A recent storm has caused a landslide. The line is blocked. Railroad workers remove the debris and the journey continues. Over the Nariz del Diablo, the devil's nose. The rails zigzag on the steep slopes. We move slowly forwards and then backwards. So the train is able to gradually overcome the difference in altitude. At the bottom of the canyon, it's necessary for the train to turn around because the line that travels to the harbor city of Guayaquil the Pacific Ocean is no longer in use. After a short break, the Chiva Express returns slowly and cautiously. The train again zigzags backwards and forwards, this time uphill, not downhill. Drive along the slope until Alausi appears again. Here, the world's last great adventure on rails comes to an end. The southern Sierra of Ecuador is a green and fertile landscape. The Andes is flatter here, and the peaks of the volcanoes are free from snow.
This is the most important monument of Incan culture in Ecuador. The ruins of Inca Pacha, a location with a long and dramatic past. The ancient Incan king's road from Quito to Cusco once passed through here. Incredibly, it was just a tiny section of a 20,000 kilometer long road system from fortress to fortress. Where today llamas peacefully graze, there were once storage buildings, baths and soldiers' dwellings. Today, only ruins remain. Ingapercha means stone walls of the Incas. The name indicates how the complex was constructed. Prior to the Incas, the Canari and their ancestors settled here and used it for various ceremonies, right up until their decline. The Inca kings believed that they were the direct descendants of the sun god and erected a sun temple on top of the highest rock. Ingapercha is a reminder of their former power. Our journey continues on a well-prepared road. In the south of Ecuador, within a high valley surrounded by the mighty peaks of the Andes, is the country's third largest city. Cuenca an historic World Heritage Site. The Tomabamba River divides the more elevated old town from the modern districts of the city. Grass and trees grow along the riverbanks and beyond is a row of buildings. The Spanish once traveled here along the ancient Inca route from Cusco while journeying to Quito. The ruins of Tomabamba have a long history. This region was settled by the Canari Indians. Cuenca was founded on the remains of prehistoric settlements and laid out according to the strict guidelines of Spanish King Carl V who was influenced by Renaissance design. The city had its high season in the second half of the 19th century due to the sale of quinine and handmade straw hats, the world famous Panama. The city has 52 churches, one for each Sunday of the year. El Sagrario was the city's first religious building to be built by the Spanish. It was the city's main church during the time of Spanish colonial rule. In 1787, Cuenca became a bishop's seat and the church was consecrated as a cathedral. Over the centuries, it was often improved and extended. And following major renovation, it became a museum of religious art. Buildings with fine facades and elaborate administrative buildings frame the Parque Central, the heart of Cuenca. With more than 2,000 Jesuit monks here, more religious buildings were needed. So a huge cathedral was built, like a fortress in the middle of the city. The Catedral Nueva is the finest religious building in the whole of South America. Its mighty blue-white domes dominate Cuenca's skyline. Cuenca is also the place in which the Sombrero de Paja Tocajilla is produced. It's also known as the Panama Hat. But its name can be deceptive. The Panama hat does not originate in Panama, but in Ecuador. The Omero Ortegas family are masters of their trade. For five generations, they have manufactured the hats from the fiber of the tequila palm tree. 
Science has shown that the tree's origin dates back to 4000 BC. It is unique. And everything is done by hand. The straw is prepared and the thin fibers braided on a wooden block. Finally, each hat is individually decorated. Packed in special boxes, the Panama is exported around the world. From Cuenca, we begin a long journey across the final pass and then downhill to the Pacific Ocean. The mountain ranges of the Andes are also a meteorological divide between the eastern lowlands and the coast. The Parque Nacional Cayas was founded in 1996 in the highlands of the western Cordilleras. From February to July, the highlands are often foggy, and rain and snowstorms are common, along with extremely low temperatures. The landscape resembles a tundra and is mostly located above the timberline, a topographically irregular area that measures around 29,000 hectares. An untouched Paramo region with cleft mountain ridges and deep-lying valleys from which the park's name of Cayas is derived. Just one road leads through the nature park. The origin of this area dates back to primordial times, to the Quaternary, when large sections of this region were covered by glaciers, as were the Andes Highlands. This wild landscape was designated as a World Heritage Site in 2003. We've reached the highest point of the road. From here, we descend, more than 4,000 meters downwards, and to as far as the coast of the Pacific Ocean. The journey lasts several hours. Many a car driver becomes tired and can consequently find themselves in a dangerous situation due to fatigue. Down in the coastal area, we're greeted by banana plantations and a tropical climate. Finally, we arrive in Guayaquil. This is our last stop on the South American continent, the Pearl of the Pacific, with its Cathedral Catolica. and with exotic views all around. In the Parque Seminaro, live iguanas, even in the trees. And feeding time is always fascinating for one and all. Guayaquil is the country's biggest city and the administrative center for the south coast. It's also a secret capital with fine hotels, restaurants, and many shops. Francisco de Orellana founded it in 1537. The first San Francisco church was devastated by fire and then rebuilt. And the Parque Centenario honors the heroes of the War of Independence with splendid flowers. In the heart of the city is a promenade flanked by trees along the generous Rio Guayas, Malecon 2000. It features a Moorish clock tower, entertainment for both young and old and beautiful fountains, and also La Rotonda, a monument that commemorates Simon Bolivar and José de San Martín. There are 450 numbered steps on Cerro Santanana mountain. Until some years ago, it was a dangerous district, but is now very popular with tourists. 
The route features fabulous views across the city and the harbour, with seafarers from all over the world and dock workers that are part of the city's daily life. A few more steps and the lighthouse comes into view. It once warned the city's inhabitants of pirates. On the uppermost plateau of the Little Green Hill is a chapel. In 1547 the city was settled here. A magical height with a remarkable view. A little below, cannons, pirates and a pirate ship are reminiscent of a perilous past. Another route down the river travels past colourful houses with small balconies. At the base of the Cerro Santa Ana is the picturesque artist's district of Las Peñas, with its renovated buildings that date back to the 19th century. This district is very popular with sightseers. A boat trip on the river provides a good view of the skyline and the nearby mountain. Glass skyscrapers withstand the tropical rain and humid heat, a triumph of building design. The city's cemetery, El Cementario, is today the city's cultural inheritance. This white city features mausoleums, sculptures and burial walls into which coffins are inserted. The Parque Historico provides visitors with an insight into the city's golden time of cacao. It features fine buildings that once stood here prior to a devastating fire, and actors demonstrate the clothing of that time. It all serves as a reminder of the great high season of this the southernmost city in the Caribbean. Around a thousand kilometers from Ecuador, within the Pacific Ocean, is a scattered group of 19 volcanic islands, the Islas Galapagos. And even below the water, there are creatures that seem to come from another world. This swimming reptile is a member of the iguana family. Growing up to a meter in length, the marine iguanas have behavioral patterns that are unique among saurians. They also have a somewhat menacing appearance. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why Charles Darwin preferred to study other animals. The islands are like a living museum and contain a large variety of fascinating animal and plant life that may seem quite familiar, but in reality have their own unique characteristics. On the coast, in addition to various species of iguana, there are mainly pinnipeds. And the Sally Lightfoot crab shines out on the dark volcanic ground. These islands derive their name from the Spanish word for turtle. For many centuries, the giant turtles were considered to be a culinary delicacy. Even today, ocean biologists and an assortment of other scientists follow in the footsteps of Charles Darwin. And in the 1960s, a research station on one of the islands was named in his honor. These waters are particularly popular with divers. However, although the archipelago is located close to the equator, the temperature of the sea is quite cold. In the winter months, the Humboldt stream that flows from Antarctica usually keeps the water at below 13 degrees Celsius. Movements of large shoals of fish don't only attract divers. One of the most feared hunters of the seas also shows an interest. Rays glide majestically through the water. They're a common sight around this group of islands and are related to the shark family.
The underwater world of the Galapagos Islands is a natural paradise for both humans and animals alike. Due to their curious and energetic ways, seals are captivating creatures that always seem to be only too happy to oblige for the perfect snapshot. Since 1959, the Galapagos Islands have been designated as a protected area. A unique natural habitat. Their most famous inhabitant may cause fear, but they're in reality totally harmless. They're vegetarian. One of the world's last natural paradises. Ecuador is truly fascinating due to its vast variety of culture and nature, and its amazing mountain landscapes are the backbone of the country. Ecuador is a unique adventure. Here, South America is at its most beautiful.